Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willing. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be enrolled, each to his own town. And Joseph, too, went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David that is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region living in the fields and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you who is Christ and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The Gospel of the Lord. I believe that this Christmas story that we have just heard is the greatest story that's ever been told. Would you agree with that? It's something, even though we hear it as a child, and hear it every year time and again, it's like it never grows old. It always seems to capture some of both simple beauty and yet profound truths that are ageless. And I'd like to present this again so that we would not fall into the routine of just hearing it as an old story, but that we would never, ever take it for granted. That we would always wonder at such questions as, why was there no room in the inn? Why? Why did Christ come? As such a simple, humble baby. Why did Mary place this Christ child in a manger? Why did angels appear to shepherds? We're so accustomed to hearing this story, sometimes we no longer allow it to impact us at a very deep level, as certainly we're invited to receive it today. We need to hear this gospel story of the Christ coming again and again. So we can understand why, as I say, it is the greatest story ever told. It begins with the situation of Luke relating that uh, a census was being taken by Caesar Augustus. It almost seems to, uh, once situated in human history, as this, this is a true fact in our history. And as history is, it's always a mixed bag of difficulty and blessing, but God can work everything out for the good. Even this very 
untimely situation of, of calling Joseph and Mary to leave their hometown in Bethlehem and travel more than 80 miles south to Bethlehem, where they have the greatest difficulty you know, finding lodging. What Luke seems to tell us in situating this in this mess of human history is that isn't this how God continues to break through in our lives? It's never the, the perfect occasion, never the ideal situation, and yet that's how God comes. And God even uses that history, as Luke seems to present this certain irony, to bring Jesus to the town of the city of David in Bethlehem, he who is of the line of David to fulfill the prophecy from of old. And then we hear that once Mary's time had reached her fulfillment, she gave birth to her firstborn son. I imagine, in one sense, Jesus' birth was quite ordinary in so far as babies being born throughout the world every day is an ordinary event, as our own birth is an ordinary event. Yet, obviously, on another level, Jesus' birth, as much like our birth, is an extraordinary event. And anyone who's given birth or witnessed a birth knows what a miracle it is. I mean, it's truly God's greatest work of creation. When we are born into this world, we could imagine Jesus' birth was every bit as ordinary yet as extraordinary as any of the birthing experiences we have participated in ourselves. And yet, truly, in another entirely different sense, this birth of this baby is the most extraordinary event in human history. For never ever was God born of man than here and now in Bethlehem. How extraordinary that God who the Jewish people always believed was at such a great distance from their experience of life. The Jews believed they could never even utter God's name because they had to hold this reverential distance between them. God becomes man. More than that, a baby. As they were expecting and hoping for a Messiah, yet that one would come as a mighty military leader to overthrow the government, here, the Roman government, here comes this helpless child born poor in the most desperate situation. What a profound lesson. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. This expression, firstborn son, has two meanings I'd like to briefly mention. First and most obvious, this was in the Jewish sense, a firstborn child in their family had special responsibilities and privileges. They were the ones who took the special responsibility of carrying on the father's work and in helping the, raise the others. So, uh, certainly Jesus was the firstborn. But that's not to be misunderstood is indicating as though Mary had any other children, because even an only child would have been called firstborn because of the special rank and privileges in the time of Christ. Secondly, perhaps more importantly, we can interpret this on a theological level. When Mary gave birth to her firstborn, the firstborn in the Jewish sense was always seen along the line of the father. So Jesus' father being God, certainly signifies that Jesus was the firstborn of the Heavenly Father, which is to say that He was the divine Son of God. And later, throughout the New Testament, various writers, particularly St. Paul, will speak about Christ as the firstborn of all creation. This is a theological term that we need to understand. Jesus is our older brother, who takes some responsibility for our lives to lead us to the Father. Huh? 
It's just a rich theological term that Luke brings into this narrative of Jesus' birth. And then we're told that Mary wraps him in swaddling clothes. It's a beautiful expression, isn't it? Wrapping him in swaddling clothes. As certainly any mother back then and there in the ancient Palestine would have taken this long white linen strip of cloth and wrapping their baby in a, in a tight blanket to keep him warm as one needs to do, of course, immediately upon being born, especially in an outdoors environment, huh? But there's something, as you might suspect, on a deeper level that we could understand. In biblical times, clothing symbolized one's identity. And throughout the Gospels, you may have heard me relate this on different occasions, clothing always was an outer sign of the inner person. Even as in the church, in New Testament times, the baptized people put on Christ by putting the baptismal robe on, and we say they clothe themselves in Christ, even as we do today, to express their new identity. So when Mary wrapped Jesus in this swaddling clothes, it somehow expressed his own humanity that she, as a human, gave to her son. This humanness, that this firstborn son of the Heavenly Father, who is truly son of God, is at the same time son of man, son of woman. There's a beautiful expression of this in the Byzantine art, in iconography. If you were to look at any icon of Christ. He wears a inner red regal robe signifying his divinity, but is almost always cloaked with an outer blue garment symbolizing his humanity. That Jesus put on this humanity as it was invested in him. You might see that in terms of Mary clothing him like any baby, like any ordinary human being. So that's what we see in these swaddling clothes, Jesus putting on humanity. But also, as you might recall my saying last week, that the infancy narratives are a prologue to the entire gospel, insofar as they already suggest and give slight hints to what will take place later on. Mary wrapping him in these swaddling clothes are almost seen as a premonition of many years later, when she will wrap him in a white linen cloth and lay him in the tomb. Here, Jesus experiences the very tragedy of what it means to be human. And then Mary lays him in a manger. You might know that a manger is a feeding trough for animals. In ancient Palestine, most mangers were made of rock, actually, where wood was rather scarce and stone most plentiful. They would be either carved in a freestanding or hewn out of a rock bed. And oftentimes that would have provided such a feeding trough to animals. So Mary could have placed them in such a manger. Then again, This manger could have been an open courtyard in a type of inn setting, or then again in a corral for animals. It would have been a natural place to feed them, a stable, if you will. Or since caves were so plentiful there in the Bethlehem hillside, perhaps it was a cave. And you've seen these different settings, probably in different crush scenes. It doesn't matter. Luke really doesn't go into that kind of detail. All he seems to indicate is that Jesus was born poor and simple in the most rustic and and yet simple way. But the fact that he seems to highlight the manger should raise our attention to asking the question, why did Mary place him in a place where animals ate. Certainly this is a striking image that would have been unlikely for any mother to do. It would have been much more likely huh, to lay him on a mat. And if she could find you know, the cloth to wrap him, certainly she could have found a mat, which was very common, or even place a clothes on the ground. 
Why did Mary place him in a manger? What does this mean? And why was it a point of such significance even for the angels to proclaim later to the shepherds, this will be a sign for you? You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I would suggest, after reading and and learning from several scripture scholars, that the manger is a symbol that Luke will develop later in the gospel, of that place where we are fed, where Jesus offers himself as food for the flock. Throughout Luke's gospel, many times Jesus will be seen at the table with sinners and friends and disciples, offering himself as nourishment to these followers and disciples. This scene also brings to mind a Old Testament quote from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, that reads, The ox knows its owner, and the ass its master's manger. But the people of Israel do not understand. You know, it struck my curiosity. Did you ever wonder why in most crib sets that there's always an ox and a donkey? Have you ever wondered why? Why is it? This is why. Because of this Isaiah passage that says, even the ox and the ass will recognize the place of nourishment there in the manger. But will we recognize the source of our salvation, the source of our nourishment, as we approach the manger? Isn't it a wonderful symbol? Or maybe we have overlooked all these years, at least I have. And so we need to understand Jesus being placed in the manger is not unlike Jesus will place himself later on a cross. From crib to cross, Jesus offers himself as nourishment for our life. And certainly there on the table of the altar for he gives himself time and again to us. Then we're told that there was no room for them in the inn. When Joseph and Mary came to the city of David, you would expect that this king of the city of David, this Messiah who has been promised to the line of David for, for generations upon generations, that they would receive him. Isn't it interesting that when the Savior of the world finally comes, the world, for the most part, does not recognize him nor receive him. We have to wonder at that. We have to ask ourselves that question, is this happening again today? What is this in that we could understand how it applies? In the Greek term for in that is used in this gospel is the word katalima. And katalima is roughly translated in, but it has a much broader meaning. It was explained to me that this could better be translated as a place where you receive hospitality. And so what the evangelist Luke is saying is that Jesus could find no place or people where he could find hospitality or welcome. Now there is, of course, the paradox of the gospel. The world that is in such need of a Savior and when the Savior comes, we're not able to accept him and receive him. In a sense, we have to ask the question of ourselves, do we have room in the inn of our schedules, of our time, within our families, our homes, and within our hearts? Remember, the irony is that Jesus it was promised through the, the, the house of David, but when he came to the house of David, the city of David in Jerusalem, they did not receive him. Oftentimes I wonder, as the Lord comes to us in church, the very house of God, many times we don't even, what should I say, take notice of the gift of the Lord that comes to us here in this house, in the communion that we receive, in the community 
that we hold as the body of Christ? We have to ask ourselves this question, you know. I'll never forget the time on, on Christmas Eve at our late afternoon masses. We have a lot of people come. I'm sure that's true of you. It's just like, you know, the special group that comes just once or twice a year, you know. They're all there. But many more people, we find even street people come. And last year, I was a number of people were put off by this very um, foul-smelling and rude-acting and behaving street person came. And people asked me to ask him to leave. And I just couldn't <laughs> because I thought, is this how Christ might appear? And I just think we need to take this gospel so serious of how we can repeat the same mistake of history. I, I think it happens without our recognizing or, or even knowing it. I think we need to recognize Jesus in the poor and the least likely to reflect him. And, and sometimes that's even in our immediate family, uh, among our own relatives, so that what I'm suggesting is that we look at there no room in the inn. We have to look at our own homes, our own parishes, our own workplaces, and find and ask, do we offer such a hospitality to welcome the stranger and the strange people in our life? Then we're told that there were shepherds in that locality living in the fields and keeping watch by turns over their flock. Luke presents the shepherds oddly, but yet so beautifully, as the first to hear the good news and act on it. Now again, you would expect, you know, if the, if the king of all creation comes, that there would be an entourage of, with a red carpet treatment of all the rich and famous people of the day coming out to greet him. Why did he pick such the blue-collar worker of the day? These outdoors men who were not known for any kind of religiosity or piety. Why were they the first to see Jesus? Why were they the first to experience the Lord and then be the first to share the good news with others. Perhaps Luke is saying and suggesting that they're not unlike the apostles, these common men and women who would be called to be shepherds of the flock, the first to experience Jesus invited, to see him and hear him, know him and love him, and then be commissioned to go and tell the story of his good news to others. And aren't we those simple shepherds? Aren't we the ones being invited to come? Let us adore him. Finally, we're told in this beautiful gospel that the angel said to the shepherds, I come to proclaim good news to you this day in David's city. A Savior has been born to you. Who is this angel? Now, I certainly believe in angels, and no doubt it occurred much as the Gospels relating, but we need to understand it in terms of how we experience this happening today. I would suggest that this angel who comes to proclaim that good news is the same person in the evangelist who proclaims the same good news to us in this Gospel. In fact, the word used here in this story for the good news is the same Greek word eongelion that's used for the word gospel, from which we have the word angel and evangel list. So what I'm saying is what the angels said to the shepherds, Luke the evangelist says to us. In other words, do you see we're right there, right here? In the same situation, we're being told, this day in our city, a Savior is born unto us, Christ the Lord. And what will be our response? We are being invited to make a place for the Lord in our homes and in our hearts. We are being invited to come, go out of our way if we need to, prepare a way to come, let us adore him. We are being encouraged to come before the manger to find there 
our nourishment, our food for our soul. And we are being instructed to go and share this good news of Christ's love with others. The question I would have us ask is, how are we being invited to come into the story of Jesus who comes to us? How are we being invited to come into the story of Jesus who comes to us today as he did yesterday? Amen. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand, Spirit of Jesus' 